Well, welcome to our first question from Fish Eater Fridays. Actually, I have three questions already came in, and my plan was to do one a week. Well, I'm going to do two this week, and we'll start with the first one, which is what do I think of Father Earl Lucian Popermacher, also known as Antipope Pius XIII? Well, I happen to know Father Popermacher. I met him in early 1976 when he had left the Capuchins and worked for a short time with the Society of St. Pius X. He had made an agreement with the Society of St. Pius X that he would not screen people at the door of a chapel asking them whether or not they assisted the Novus Ordo. He violated that and got into a disagreement with uh, Father Hector Boldick, who was he was working with out of Houston, Texas. He, he came out of Houston, Texas, like Father Boldick did. And he stayed with the society, I would say, three to four months, 76, quitting in May of 76, just before Archbishop Lefebvre was due to come to Stafford, Texas, St. Jude's Shrine for the Confirmations, which I went to. In fact, Father Pogermacher was coming through Oklahoma City at the time, and he's the one that prepared the confirmation class I was in there in Oklahoma City. And that was the first time I had contact with Father Pogermacher. Uh, in about 1985, he was coming to uh, uh, the uh, St. Mary's, Kansas area, where I lived at the time. He was coming to two different families who had left the uh, SSPX, Society of St. Pius X, there in St. Mary's. At that time, I'd already been convinced of, one, the vacancy of the papacy, and two, the fact that traditionalism is not Catholic because the priests and bishops have no authority or jurisdiction from the Catholic Church to function. It's kind of interesting. A mutual friend of one of the families and ourselves was in town, and we were all gathered together. And uh, I was talking with, uh, I won't name their names, talking with the uh, man, the head of the household, and he started asking questions about jurisdiction, uh, traditionalism, and all this stuff, and I spent an hour, two hours speaking on the subject, not realizing that Father Pogermacher was actually on the road at that very moment, headed towards St. Mary's, due to arrive, I think, either that evening or the next evening. It was real close. He had told both families, do not tell Bodens I am coming. Well, my parents had had a discussion with Father Povermarker about his promise, which they were aware of, which he was asking them to violate. Okay. Uh, in retrospect, he might have actually been on the right side because are we supposed to admit people who are outside the church to Holy Communion? Of course not. Those who actively participate in no sort of uh, are outside the church. Okay? So they should not be admitted to the sacraments, except for sacrament of confession, uh, until they have removed themselves from the Novus Ordo. How this should be done, that's a totally different question. We won't dive into that here. We will into other videos sometime, and I already have Communicatio and Sacris, which this touches on briefly, as well as uh, my uh, first video on the sermon from the Mass in Rossville. But let's return to Father Povermacher, because that's what this question is about. And so I was talking with his family a week or two later, and they said, Father Povermacher been in town. And they explained, well, he doesn't have jurisdiction. And so we were discussing things, and finally I said to myself, I, I wrote my letter at the end of 1983. It had been almost two years, because it was, I believe, November of 85. <clears throat> I sat down and said, I'm going to review this, and I wrote jurisdiction during the great apostasy. And then next time I saw the family, I took that out, and I said, here, this explains what I believe on jurisdiction. Father well, Popper Marker was due in again, so I said, I brought a couple of copies. I said, give this copy to Father Povermacher and tell him I would like to discuss this matter with him. In fact, I extended an invitation so we could come over and we could discuss in my own library where if we had a question, 
we could just simply head over to the books and look it up right then there. Because as I said in my 83 letter, December 26, 83 letter, which is on the internet, if you think I'm wrong, set me straight. I want to present the truth. That is my purpose in life. I love God. God loves truth. That's where we should be. Father Povermacher took my paper, declined my invitation, and simply said to the families, it's wrong. And so I got his address from them and registered, mailed him a copy of jurisdiction during the Great Apostasy. He sent back a copy of the thing on jurisdiction he prepared, which I'd already been given a copy by one of the two families, and which I took into account when I was making my refutation. I noticed an interesting point. He used Moral Theology by Harry Bert Yone. I possess two copies, I believe, of the 1945 first edition. He was working from the 1959 whatever edition that was. And when I compared his 59 with my 45, there were some significant differences on the point at hand. So that could have thrown him off course. Okay, so we'll cut him a little slack here. Well, we had no contact after that until 1990. In uh, 1989, with the, well, actually, I was the co author. Teresa Stanfield Benz was the principal author of Will the Catholic Church Survive the 20th Century? Together, we wrote it. She wrote two thirds of it, took it through seven proofreading, blah, blah, blah. I won't go into the details. But we'll return to this in a moment. I wrote one third, including. Jurisdiction during the Creative Apostasy, which was presented in here as a chapter with one slight omission, which uh, was something I put in the Father Pulvermacher's original. Now let us back up to 1986, um, early 86, and get a call from another man in the area. And he had gotten a hold of a copy of my jurisdiction during the Great Apostasy, because he agreed with me on the jurisdictional position. He said, David, I love this paper. May I have your permission to make copies and circulate it? And I said, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, go ahead. My name was on everything. She, I mean, in fact, when he did that, I started, I sent copies to all my friends. I thought, well, this presents my position. It's not been adequately refuted by anyone yet. To this date, has not been refuted by anyone, to me at least. And so, when the book came up, I did put it in Will Catholic Church by the Twice Century. I made it one little line I put in there about the matter of Lefebvre and his Masonic ordination. I put that in there because I knew Father Povermacher and I were in agreement on that position at that time. And I removed it from the copies I sent out because I thought it shouldn't go in there because I have not provided proof. Okay. And I believe when you put something in something you're circulating, you should put in also that matter is discussed elsewhere in well, the Catholic Church about the 20th century. So a couple months after the uh, book was published on January 25th, 1990, uh, sent copies all over, I get a letter from Father Pulvermacher. A check with, for 10 copies and $200 donation to promote the papal election. Nice little letter. Got to thinking, doesn't Father Povermacher realize that I hold the same position or jurisdiction I did in 85? And then I stopped thinking. In the letter he said, I saw a copy of your book, I mean, writing to Christ King Library, when I was in my circuit. So I said, he knows what he is buying. have been sight unseen, my plan would have been to ship him a single, shipping his 10 copies and ask him if he wanted his $200 back or not after he saw it. But since he's not buying a pig in the poke, <laughs> he's a nice letter thanking him. And went my worry, Mary way, didn't hear another word from him. Of course, we went ahead with the papal election. And so things go on. Don't hear anything about him for years. I'm back east in Ohio. And that's when I'm in one meeting. And they bring up uh, 
uh, another claimant to the papacy. And they, well, someone says, we hear you've resigned in favor of Linus II. And I said, Linus who? <laughs> and they explained to me, Linus II, Victor von Pence, the 1994 election. I said, well, someone's putting it out there. They showed me the piece of paper that said it. And an article by a Ken Mock promoting a papal election. And I said, well, I know Ken Mock, but I have no idea who the, these, well, who Victor von Pence is. I had some idea, but I mean, I had no idea about the election. I'd only heard a rumor the Tookites have held an election. That's all I knew. I said, I've resigned in favor of nobody. Well, at that very moment, they also discovered there was a papal election about to be held. In fact, it was held a day or two after this. And lo and behold, we have anti-Pope Pius XIII. Like the von Pence election, the Paul Walker election, the electors had this book. Okay, The von Pence election, von Pence didn't have a copy. I tried to get a hold of him when I heard of him in 1992 or so. But the address I had by the time I got it was not good. It was, I think, in Winona, the post office box. I thought, well, he's not there anymore. And I lost track and could not find him. Uh, so Von Pence didn't. But uh, Lopez Gaston, or go, I can't remember, Gaston Lopez, whatever his name is, Bishop, he had it because he almost came to the 90 election. We were in contact. And some of the others, Elizabeth Gerstner, I believe, was involved. But let's move over to the Polarmacher election. Ken Mock, he had received several copies of the book to promote election in 90. Uh, he was involved in the 94 election and pulled out the last minute like he did in 90. He was involved in the 98 election and Pulvermacher threw him out the last moment from what I hear. But Pulvermacher had a copy. Gordon Bateman, Gordon Cardinal Bateman eventually, he had a copy. And so these people based their elections on the work Teresa Benz and I did. They knew of the election, my election in 1990. They took no cognizance of it whatsoever, except Mock's uh, statement that I had resigned favor Alliance II, second, which was totally unfounded. Mock knew that. So I consider that Pius XIII, Father Pulvermacher, is an imposter. He's an anti-pope. Because he knew there was a true pope elected, took no cognizance of the election whatsoever, made no effort to contact me, neither did the uh, group in 94, who also knew my existence. Father Thomas Fooey, who had participated in the 94 election, had written to me shortly after my election saying, you did the wrong thing. So he knew of my claim. And they should have at least contacted me. If I ignored him, then maybe they could ignore me. But they didn't even t take the opportunity to contact me. They knew where I was. I mean, they could find me easily enough. Okay. And so, that's I happen to know Father Pulvermacher. I also happen to know his brother, Father Carl Pulvermacher, who, ironically, said someday we're going to have to have a papal election right there in Oklahoma City. But, and another thing I know just about their personalities, Father Carl Pulvermacher and Father Lucian Pulvermacher are as different as night and day. They not only look different, they act differently, their personalities are totally different. And so, that's a little bit what I know about uh, Father Lucian Pulvermacher. Thanks for sending in your questions. <laughs>